morning, everybody. Welcome to today's edition of Faith and Healing School. Wow, it is December 3rd. Who knew? Christmas is going to be here before we know it. So, glory to God, we're glad you guys are joining us. Um, turn your Bibles over to James chapter 1. The last time I was with you guys, we were speaking about being a barrier-breaking type of believer. So, uh, we're going to continue down that road today, so while you guys are turning there, we'll pray. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word, Lord. We thank you that it ministers to our hearts today, Father. As we've come expecting to hear from you, we know we will never be disappointed, Father, because the word tells us that when it goes forth, it never returns void, meaning it will produce in every believer's heart that's willing and ready to hear from you, Father. And we thank you for it. We thank you for the anointing that's on your word to break yokes of bondage and chains of anything, anything that's keeping us bound up, Father. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your being our need meter, our source. And we say, bring glory to yourself this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So I told you guys to turn over to James chapter one. I want to read uh, verses two through four. And again, we're talking about barriers, but um, you know, the Word of God was pretty specific in James chapter 1 to tell us that we would face some circumstances in our lives, that we would face barriers. Uh, verse, uh, James, James uh, chapter 1 verse 2 starts out by saying, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. Amen. So the book of James, James is the author inspired through the Holy Ghost, point blank tells us that we are going to face obstacles, that we will never, uh, we weren't promised to walk through this life without any circumstance. Quite the opposite. We were going to face some things. And, and James is specific in telling us to do what? Count it all joy when we come up against these circumstances. So in the reality, or in in the um, context of what our message is talking about, about barriers, that these barriers that we face, we need to count them all joy. Why? Because they're doing something, even though they don't feel good in our lives, even though they may seem catastrophic at times in our lives, they're not. You know, we know that God is not the barrier bringer, the enemy who has a, a, a real hatred for believers especially believers that are standing on and believing the word of God, is going to be the one who's going to throw up barriers. To do what? Stop us from walking in the fullness of God's plan for our lives. To get us back, to shrink back away from the things of God. Because if we continue down the road of following God, fulfilling God's plan for our lives, his will for our lives, walking in all the blessings of God, we are a threat to him. So he throws up barriers. You know, that the enemy does. And I was just thinking about this this morning as I was meditating on this verse of Scripture, that we give sometimes the devil way too much credit for being the only barrier bringer. Very often it can be us ourselves. Uh, we can make a wrong decision. We can make a choice to act on something we shouldn't act on. You know, whether it's a thought that the enemy brings and he's behind it, or it's our own flesh, you know, where we get off in a fleshly kind of uh, situation where we act out and do something that our flesh wants us to do. You know, we can't blame him for everything. Um, certainly he is behind, and the author of sickness, illness, disease, lack, that is everything that was under the curse of the law, he is certainly behind. But very often we can bring those same barriers into our lives by making wrong decisions. Amen? So we started to look at um, how do we break through barriers, right? We need to know a little bit about barriers in order to be a, break, a barrier-breaking believer. And first and foremost, we need to realize that our biggest barrier has already been taken care of. And we had nothing to do with it. You know, Jesus ransomed us back to God, right? So the barrier that existed between man and God through Adam's discretion in the garden, that spiritual separation from God was done away with, right? The Word of God tells us that when Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross, the veil was separated from top to bottom. And the veil was a symbolism of the law. 
right? And when that veil was separated from top to bottom, why was it done that way? It was proof positive that no man could have done that. The veil, the top of the veil that separated um, the temple area from the Holy of Holies was so high up that instantaneously no man could have separated and torn it from top to bottom. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled the law. The law was a tutor pointing uh, the Jews for, toward the need for a savior. And when Jesus gave up the ghost and ransomed us back into right standing with God, that law was fulfilled. And so that we could say the biggest barrier we would ever face, spiritual death, and an eternity spent in hell with the, with the devil was done away with. So the biggest barrier you will ever face in your life has already been destroyed. Glory to God, that is good, good news. Can you say amen? And knowing that, though, knowing that our biggest barrier, right, and the same one, the same Jesus who redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us, is with us through every barrier-breaking uh, situation that we run up against today. And we, uh, we're going to start taking a look at that today, right? So a couple other things we looked at. Number one, our biggest barrier has already been taken care of. We just talked about that. And number two, we need to recognize the barrier in our way may be the very key to our blessing. Every time we break through a barrier that the enemy tries to bring against us, right? What does the Word of God tell us? That Everything that the enemy tries to bring for our harm, God will turn it around and use for our good and his glory. So what does that mean? Every time we stand firm on what the word of God says is ours. And what do those barriers do? Those barriers oppose what the word says. They're barriers that are designed to make us think that the word of God isn't true, to get us off into a realm of reasoning. When we start to reason, we start to waver. When we waver, the Word of God tells us, a man who wavers will receive nothing, right? So when we're standing firm on the Word against our barrier, right, when we're continuing to, to walk in the goodness and fullness of God despite what we see outwardly as a circumstance, that's what busts through those barriers. And that single thing or that multiple thing you're facing today, whether it's sickness, illness, disease in your body, whether it's lack of any kind, whatever is has been formed against you, right? That barrier has been formed against you. God will turn it around. What the enemy meant for harm. You know, the word of God tells us, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The only way it can prosper is if we allow it to prosper. So as that barrier is formed and we stand on the word, knowing what belongs to us in Christ, by faith, despite what we see, right? We're not to be moved by circumstances. And as we bust through that barrier, we wind up on the other side of it at a higher level in our walk with God. Just like James chapter one, verses two through four tell us. That's why we need to count it all joy. We count it all joy because on the other side of that circumstance we're facing is a higher level with God. Our faith gets built from faith to faith and glory to glory. That very barrier you're up against today, my encouragement to you guys this morning is continue to stand on the truth of the word. And as we do so, we become barrier-breaking believers. And on the other side of that barrier is a higher level with God, right? You just went to a place now where you can believe God for more, bigger and bigger. What are we doing? We're building our faith, right? The Word of God in, in, in Proverbs tells us a strong spirit of a man or woman sustains them in time of illness and really in time of everything. Any barrier we face, the Word of God, our strong spirit being fed on the Word of God sustains us, right? And we can bust through anything that the enemy tries to bring our way, any barrier. Why? Because he gave us our Word. He gave us the Word of God, his words, his truth. When we see what belongs to us in Christ, all the promises of God, all those things we've been redeemed from that were under the curse of the law, all those prosperity type uh, plan that God has for us. Now, prosperity. Remember, I always use the illustration of a circle, right? God's prosperity is a full circle, nothing lacking, nothing broken. It's not just about finances, but yes, finances are 
part of God's plan and blessing for our lives. But he wants us to, be, to lead a prosperous life of all kinds, prosperous relationships, prosperous health, prosperity uh, and favor wherever we go, blessed coming in, blessed going out. That's God's plan and will for our lives. But the enemy will throw up those barriers to try to get us to shrink back from that, from walking in the light of the truth. So, number two was recognize the barrier in your way may be the very key to your blessing. The third thing we looked at was, do we know for sure that the barrier we're up against is really a barrier? You know, many times what we see happening in our lives that we think is a barrier really isn't. Why? Because sometimes the things we face, you know, it's like saying... um, it's like saying when we're facing something, even something God's asked us to do for him, does it always seem easy? Does it always seem like it's a walk in the park? No, quite the opposite. When you step out in faith and start following God, circumstances are going to rise up against you. And God may even put you into, and give you, and, you know, put a call on your life into an area of ministry or uh, here at the church uh, or in your neighborhood to go you know, minister to people. Uh, again, we've all been given a mandate, right? We've all been given a ministry, which is to preach the gospel of the lost and dying world. And that does not come without opposition. And a lot of times, the thing, the very thing we think is a barrier. You know, I used the illustration a couple of weeks ago of the workplace, right? The, if you're having difficulty on your job, maybe with your boss, your fellow workers, things are getting a little out of control. And you're like, I, I need a new job. I need to get out of here. Are you being led by a natural circumstance? Or should we be seeking God in everything, right? Proverbs 3, 4, and 5 is pretty specific and said, you know, we need to bring all things to God, to seek him in all things. Because that very thing that you think you're up against may be God's assignment for you to stay put. Why? You're the light bearer at that job. Doesn't mean it has to be comfortable. You know, an assignment from God is not always easy to fulfill, meaning easy in the sense that he will always be with you in the middle of your assignment. But the hard part is the enemy is going to throw up barriers. But if you're, if you, you might be like that, I just said, that person at that workplace, and it could be anything, it could be ministry or anything related, right? Where you may feel like it's a barrier, but the reality is you're right where you want to be. We need to know for sure that the barriers we're up against are absolutely barriers. Now, if we're talking about sickness, illness, disease, lack, or anything along those lines, they are certainly barriers. We know for sure they are because they're contrary to what the Word of God says we should have for our lives. But if it's, it's the context of a job, a context of you stepping out in faith and uh, as, as a ministry uh, here at the church or at home, and you know things are a little rocky along the way, well, we should kind of expect that. You know, when we step out in faith and start fulfilling the will of God for our lives, we put a target on our back. And that target is the enemy saying, I'm going to try and uh, oppose every single thing they're trying to accomplish for God. Because it's not only about your life. It's not only the fulfillment of the will of God for your life, but it's every single person you could ever touch uh, for, for God. And the enemy hates that, right? So we have to first and foremost recognize for sure or know for sure that that very barrier we're up against is truly a barrier. And I use the illustration of, and I want to read this, because I think this is really important. Um, I wanted to cover this again this week, because a lot of people think they're facing barriers, opposition, that they may feel is a barrier, but it might not be one. It's just where they are for a season where God wants them, but the going can be a little tough. And I wanted to use the illustration of David over in 1 Samuel chapter 18. I want to read verses 5 through 10. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul is slain as thousands, David is ten thousands, right? First of all, we know that David, although while this was happening, had already been anointed king of Israel. Hasn't manifested for him yet. Saul's still on the scene. Now, what did, was David a great, faithful, good and faithful servant of Saul? Absolutely. 
Then Saul, I want to go on to verse 8. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000, and to me they have ascribed only 1,000. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward, uh, verse uh, 10. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. Was David actually Saul's problem? Nope. David was not Saul's problem. Saul was his own problem. So what I'm getting at when we truly try to recognize if that barrier you think you're up against really is a barrier. Was David a barrier for Saul? No, not at all. He was a tremendous help for Saul. Saul should have seen that song or heard that song that those women are saying, say, look, I got this great man who's faithfully serving me, helping me, right? Helping me fulfill what God has called him to do. But the opposite happened. Saul looked at that day forward as David as an enemy, as a barrier, when David, in fact, was not his barrier. David was no problem for Saul. Quite the opposite. He was there to support and help him. But Saul's own problems with pride and being a people pleaser was actually the barrier, not David. So we need to recognize what our true barriers are. Are we really up against something that the enemy's bringing for our harm, or does it just feel that way? When we start saying words like, well, it feels that way, we're in trouble because we should never be feeling led. We should never be emotionally led. We should always be spirit led. And you're the spirit, you know, the same spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead that's resonant on the inside of you and your human spirit will interact with God's spirit and you'll know for sure whether it's a barrier. But we can't go by what we feel. We have to go by what we discern in our spirits. So for example, like we just looked at, this barrier for Saul wasn't a barrier. It was a perception of what he entertained, thinking that David was his problem. David was never his problem. The, David was never his barrier. Saul was Saul's own problem. And if you're up against something that you're not sure is a barrier, we have to seek God. If it's something like I use the example of work-related, you know, you're, you're, just, you're, you're in a job position, it doesn't feel good, but you think it's a barrier, but you're not sure. We need to seek. You could be the one that God sent to that place to bring the light of the truth. So we have to make sure our barriers are ours. And that's kind of what we covered uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I want to go on a little bit further with being a barrier-breaking Christian. You know, breaking through our barriers at times may feel like personal sacrifice. And there is personal sacrifice involved in being a barrier-breaking uh, believer. And I always look at it, I always think about the context of Abraham. Abraham's obedience to sacrifice Isaac literally was a personal sacrifice. Um, turn over to Genesis chapter 22. Let's read verses 15 through 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham the second time of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed." because you have obeyed my voice. Now, that's the, that's the end of the story. What I want to look at this morning is that feeling that Abraham, I'm sure, had that his barrier breaking was a personal sacrifice. And for him, it literally was. We know the story. Isaac becomes the son of promise, the promised one given to Abraham to fulfill God's promise to Abraham that in and through him all nations shall be blessed and that his descendants would be as grains of sand on the sea and as stars in the sky. Now, God says to him, you know what, Abraham? Do this for me. Go to the mountain, take the lad, and offer him up to me as a sacrifice. Can you imagine that barrier that just existed 
or just was formed in Abraham's life. Two things we can see here. That barrier breaking that he went through felt like a personal sacrifice. But the reality is that barrier was also not a true barrier for him because God would never bring a, a barrier to destroy us. It was the actual thing that propelled him further, but he still had to break through the barrier of getting through what he was told to do. So, but we know the, ab the attitude that Abraham had was an attitude that showed he knew who his God was. As, and I'm paraphrasing for the sake of time, not reading through the whole thing. But as him, him Isaac, and the servants travel to, 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 to fulfill this sacrifice of Isaac, what does he say just before going up the mountain to the people that were with him? He says and makes a statement of faith before the manifestation of what he was believing God for ever happened. What was that statement of faith? Me and the lad shall return. Was he told to, to physically kill his son? Yes. Was he going, was he on his way to doing that? Yes. We know the rest of the story. They get to the mountain and uh, Abraham is fully persuaded because he gets stopped in his tracks as he raises the knife above his head. He was fully persuaded to do what he was told to do. What does that show? That Abraham knew that no matter, he was going to do what he was told to do. And he was saying, look, Lord, if I have to physically kill Isaac, you have every resource available to raise him from the dead if need be. I'm just going to do what you called me to do. Why? Abraham walked and talked and fellowship with God daily. That was his attitude when it came time to break through his barrier that I'm going full on with what God told me to do. And we know the story. The ram became the replacement, a type and shadow of Jesus Christ right? He didn't have to kill his son, well, glory to God. But if God wanted to do it a different way and he did kill Isaac, we know and should have that same assurance that God would have raised Isaac from the dead on the spot. Amen. So glory to God. We have to have Abraham's attitude when it comes to breaking through barriers by knowing who our God is. You know, we just, I just, Gave you a scripture a few minutes ago. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Right? We all know the scripture. The reality is, do we know that? We know the scripture, but do we really know the scripture? Is it truly rooted and grounded in your heart? No weapon means no weapon. No, the word no is an all-encompassing word, meaning everything. So no weapon means not one single weapon can form against you. No means no. It's an all-encompassing word. That means zero. Zero weapons formed against you can prosper. Now, people might say, but Pastor, I, something happened. It, it, I'm not winning. No, you're winning. The only way a weapon formed against you can prosper is if you allow that weapon to prosper. That's the only way anything the enemy tries to form against us can prosper in our life by allowing and entertaining and giving the enemy access to operate in our lives. What are we doing? We're allowing, when you, we think about a barrier, a barrier is a separation from something, right? The enemy comes and forms a barrier, but his focus is to, now a barrier is between, let's say, you and the enemy. He forms it, but he's trying to form a stronghold around you, right? Strongholds of the mind. You know, so often, the barriers are formed in our thought life. The enemy coming against what the Word of God says, directly opposed to what the Word says, by trying to get us to entertain a thought, forming a barrier. Then what does he want to do? He wants to hop over the barrier onto our side of the barrier and start to operate and act in our lives. And if we entertain that, if we allow him access, the weapon can prosper. But the Word says, wait a second, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. If you don't allow the prospering of that weapon, then it can never prosper. Basically, what I'm saying is we can't entertain or think about or rationalize about any barrier we're up against. 
we have to look at barriers we're facing, whether it's sickness, illness, and disease, or anything you're up against today, through the context of the promises contained in the Word of God. When we see that barrier, could barrier be something in the natural? Yes, like a doctor's report. It's a barrier. It's a bad one, right? That's a barrier. Could it be a symptom in your body? Yes, that's a barrier. But do we, do we look at that barrier and say, well, it doesn't look good? How does God look at that circumstance? You think God's going, wow, they got a really bad doctor's report. Hang on here. We got a problem. No. No, because he knows his promises. And we have to look at those barriers we're up against through the light of the word. What does the word say about it? I don't care what I'm seeing. Do we deny circumstance? Absolutely not. But do we call things that be not as though they were? Absolutely. Can you see a bad doctor's report and still call yourself healed? Yes. People have said this to me on a number of occasions. They'll, they'll say things like, well, when I, when I confess healing over my body or I declare that I'm healed, I feel like I'm lying. Because that's hasn't manifested in my body yet. We're not lying. We just choose to say what the Word says is ours. The Word doesn't lie. The Word of God tells us that God is not a man, that he can lie. So the truth is, the real lie is that sickness, illness, and disease in your body. That's the lie. The truth is what the Word says about it. So when you declare yourself healed before the manifestation of your healing actually comes into your body, you're telling the truth. The sickness is the lie. That's the way we have to look at it. You're not lying. I'm just declaring what's mine in Christ because that's the true. That's the true. The lie is what's actually trying to operate in your body. That's the lie. Why? Because it's been brought by the father of lies who will use any means on his tool belt to try to get you off of fulfilling your, your, your promise of God for your life. It's that simple. That's the lie. And we have to break through those barriers. We can't entertain them. Any thought that the enemy brings that's diametrically opposed to the Word of God, the Word tells us it needs to be taken captive. And when you look up that, that phrase, and I, I talk about this a lot because it's important. You know, the Bible tells us, you, know, you remember the story of the man who had a number of uh, demons cast out of him? And then he went away, came back. Then the, the, the enemy tried to come back into his life. They found that it was all swept clean and good to go, and more came back than left. That guy had a problem. He emptied, the demons were out of him, but he didn't fill himself up with something else. You know, when we take a thought captive, the scripture that says that, you know, we have scripture for that that says, take every thought captive that presents itself above the knowledge of Christ. But when you look up that phraseology in the Greek, it not only means to take a captive, so you gotta get a hold of that thought, but it says to cast it down in the word, but in the Greek, it actually means to replace it to lead that thought away. We can't allow a thought, a negative, a negative thought from the enemy. And now the, that negative thought from the enemy is always going to be diametrically opposed to the word, or it may seem like the word, but it's going to be a distortion of the word, just like he did to Jesus in the wilderness, right? So we got to grab a hold of that thought, cast it down or lead it away. And what does it mean by leading it away? We have to replace it with something. As we lead it away, we need to lead something else in. We need to lead in what the Word of God says about that negative thought that the enemy just tried to bring. He's always going to be bringing thoughts of doubt, unbelief, death, destruction, and lies. Again, his sole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And I use this illustration, and I just really feel impressed to repeat it, is I, as a believer, for a lot of years, Looked at the scripture, you know, John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not except to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, certainly you want to steal every promise of God from you. And his end goal is to kill you. He wants to take you out, literally physical death. The reality is he's so stupid because he loses anyway. You know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if he kills a believer, you're, he's sending us to our final reward anyway, which is stupid. But he doesn't want us to have a good journey here, which also the word promises us that we, we'd be satisfied with long life here on the earth, to not, to not get us to a point where we fulfill the call of God on our lives. But 
He can steal from us if we allow him. He can physically kill from us. But isn't it kind of weird that it says steal, kill, and destroy after? Well, wait a second. If he's stolen from me and I'm dead, how can he just, what's there left to destroy? I'm already dead. Pastor Craig Hagen, when we were out at um, the men's, Rhema Men's Conference a couple of weeks ago, said this. And I was like, that's it. He said he wants to steal from you. He wants to physically kill you. And he wants to destroy your legacy. Meaning if he can prematurely kill you, he will destroy your descendants. He will destroy the people you could have come in contact with for Christ. That's his, that's his motive. That's his MO, for lack of a better term, his modus operandi. That's the way he tries to work. But no weapon formed against us can prosper. The only way it can is if we allow him. We need to put up a barrier against his barrier. Do you ever notice old fortresses? If you look back and do some research, like the, ca- the early castles in like the, 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 the early centuries, you know, the uh, medieval times kind of castles and uh, even fortifications more um, recent. You look at some of the, some of the fortifications in the, in the early world wars and the wars in the, in the 19th century. The, the fortifications were built not with just one wall. They were built with a wall and then an inside wall. There was two walls. We need to form our own barrier, right? Not the barrier we're talking about that we need to break through that the enemy's trying to bring against us. We need to form a barrier to keep him out, an inside wall up against his wall. And what's that barrier? The word of God. That's our barrier. We need to form a barrier that keeps him out. And how do we do that? By keeping and spending time in fellowship with God and in the word. Too many believers to this day don't know what belongs to them in Christ. They just don't. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at um, not having a, a false identity, right? Right before we got into talking about barrier breaking. And we were using the illustration of the Israelites uh, journey through the wilderness, the first generation failing, and then due to the fact that the spies went into the land, 12 gave, 12 went out, 10 gave a good report, two gave a bad report, turn, switch out, 10 gave a bad report, two gave a good report. Um, I was thinking about numbers in my head. So two gave a good report, 10 gave a bad report. And I, I used this on one Sunday morning when I was ministering that sometimes I wonder, and I don't know this to be factual, but it, I was, I, it, it, I like, I'm, I'm interested in numbers that we see a lot of in the Bible, and a lot of them have representations and meanings. But I was looking at two gave a good report, 10 gave a bad report. That means 16.7% of the spies that went out gave a good report. And I use the illustration. Sometimes it makes me wonder, are 16.7% of believers walking in the fullness of God? Because a lot of times, you know, I, I can think back to years in ministry. How many people that I speak to in our circles don't spend time in the Word of God. And it actually, to this day, still blows my mind. You know, and, and the, believe it or not, guys, I'm just keeping it real with you. We all should know the importance of it. I don't think anybody that ministers from this pulpit could impress upon everybody out there more than we do how important it is to spend daily time in fellowship in the Word. But the reality is we can't come to your house and make you do it. And if we want to be barrier-busting, breakthrough-type believers, we have to spend time in the Word. And I really believe, after listening, after doing some research online and things of that nature, the percentage of believers that spend daily time in the Word is a lot smaller than you would think. Now, what what should the percentage be? 100%. 100%. Is it possible to walk in victory, the God kind of victory in our lives, to be barrier breakers without any personal time in the Word? No way whatsoever. There's believers out there, and this is true. Look it up. Look it up for yourself. There's believers out there. There's areas of Christianity that will tell you healing is not for today. It's not God's will to heal or It's his will if it be his will specifically for you. 
if we take that just through Scripture, first of all, Isaiah chapter 53 says, by his stripes you're healed, right? 1 Peter 2, 24 says, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are. That in of itself should be enough. But if, it, if we look at the second part of what I just said, well, you know, God will heal me if it's his will for him to heal me. Wouldn't that make him a respecter of persons? And what do we know the word says? He is not a respecter of persons. So if you believe that way, you're believing what? Lies. That means the enemy has been given a legal right to do what? Steal from you. You've given him the legal right to steal divine health and healing from you. You've given him a legal right to kill you. Because if you don't get a hold of something in your body, it will inevitably kill you. If you don't know that healing is yours. It just, it, it's just unfortunate reality. It will, you will allow the devil, you've allowed him to steal divine health and healing from you. You've allowed him to kill you. And then you've also allowed him to do step three we just talked about, steal your, destroy your legacy. We have to spend daily time in the word to know what's ours. End of sentence, there's no way, there's no other way to do it. You know, there's people thinking right now out there that financial lack glorifies God. How in the world does that glorify God? A, gro a broke Christian never glorified God. It's just, there's no way. Let's go on a little bit here. Um, all right, so we just look like breaking through our barrier may feel like a personal sacrifice. Number five, the way to break through your barrier may not make any sense whatsoever to you. You know, I found out most often if God tells me to do something that doesn't make sense, I'm rest assured that's from God. Because if it all makes 100% in the natural, do we really have to put faith behind it? I use the illustration of, you know, God's called me into an area in ministry that I've been doing for 40 years. Now, that may happen. But more often than not, he's going to call you into a ministry or an area of ministry that makes you feel so uncomfortable about stepping out in faith and doing it so that what? You can step out in faith and do it. It's just the way it is. But the way to break through your barrier may not make any sense. Turn over to Joshua chapter 6. Let's start in verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. We know Jericho, right? Jericho was a fortified city surrounded by what? Barriers, walls. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around. Now, this is where, wait a second. We're a pretty good army here. Can you picture Joshua trying to maybe reason this out after he hears this? And we know what he's going to say. We should all be familiar with this. But can you imagine Joshua in the natural trying to reason? Wait a second. We're a big army. We, we fight people all the time. Wait a second. We just, I don't know, Lord, make the doors open up or something. We'll just fight them. Yeah, you know, we'll just, you know, they can come out. Let, let them come out of the city. We'll, we'll take them out. But yet, they fought a lot of battles in the natural, right? There was a lot of physical man against man kind of battles. But yet the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king, the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all your men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall, the barrier, right, of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Now think about that in the context of what I just said. The Israelite army had fought tons of battles. And I could picture Joshua going, really? This is how we're going to do this one? But what does that say? What, illustrate, what can we glean from that? When we're up against the barrier, we should all know the general promises of God for our lives. Is divine health and healing a general promise? Absolutely. But what do we need after that? Specific direction to destroy that barrier. What's a specific direction? I can't tell you that. We have to get into prayer. 
We have to get into listening to the Holy Ghost. We have to get into the Word to find out what specific prayer is for our, or specific instruction is for our barrier. My barrier, maybe I'm up against the same barrier you are, but God wants me to do it this way, and he wants you to do it that way. Neither, neither one are wrong. They're both right, but they're specific for your life. We have to seek specific instruction based on the general promise of God, healing, for example, and then specific instruction on how God wants that to manifest in our lives. You know, I, I, was, I shared this with a couple of people. My wife certainly knows. She might be watching. Um, I've been battling, and it, it's a battle, right? Believing for healing is a battle. I've been ba battling with a shoulder injury for months. I don't know exactly when I injured it. Um, I did break my shoulder twice wrestling as a, as a younger guy and, um, and standing on the word for healing, right? And standing on the word and standing on the word. Symptoms haven't gone away, and I'll be honest with you, they've gotten a little worse. And I was, I was praying the other day, and I actually shared this with a text with Pastor Eddie. I said, as I was praying, I know the, I know the promise, I know healing belongs to me. It's mine. It's not if, it's when, right? But what would you have me do? What's your plan for me for the healing to manifest? And I text Pastor Eddie the other day because Pastor Eddie, if you guys know Pastor Eddie, he knows everybody, right? He knows everybody, somebody, in, and I said, hey, um, I felt impressed. Uh, do you know a good orthopedic doctor in the area? And we started talking a little bit. And, you know, his, of course, his text back to me, everything okay? Yeah, I said, look, I'm, I'm standing on the word for healing, something that I've been dealing with. But literally, I was standing on the word, but I didn't really take it to God and say, well, what do you want me to do about this? And then when I finally did, it was like, well, you need to go get, you need to facilitate and seek it through a medical professional situation. Glory to God, those people have the same desire that God has for us to help us. Right? So right after that, you know, we, I, I tracked down a really good orthopedic surgeon, orthopedic doctor here in Tom's River. I'm going to see him next week. You know, I know I'm healed. It's just a way we're going to facilitate the manifestation of it because that's the specific direction I've got. I've had things in the past in my life where medical situations were concerned where God just said, nope, just stand on the word. You're healed. That was specific direction for that particular instance. We need to seek specific direction for our barrier-breaking instructions based on the promises that are contained in the Word. Can you say amen? That's good news. That's absolutely good news. And let's close with number six. Number six was, and we're going to actually continue down this road a little bit next week, but are we seeing our barrier through our own eyes or God's? Now, I'm going to leave you guys with that as we pick this up next week. Are we seeing our barrier through our own eyes, what we see, or what God sees? Amen? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you've met us exactly where we're at with what we need to hear today, each individually, with nuggets of truth from your word, Father. And we thank you as they take root in our hearts. We know as we apply the word, that we don't, we're not just hearers only, but active doers of the word, that the things we're believing you for will manifest in our lives. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So glory to God. We love you guys. Uh, come out 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Be here in church. We'd love to see you. Uh, we, can, we can certainly spend time in the word together. Amen.